Hi, I'm Exo, and this video is about the revamped backend in Exodus version 6. Now, one of the drawbacks to version 5 and all the prior versions before that was each game had its own launch file, configuration file, and install file. Which meant if we wanted to make a universal change to the way we did things, we had to edit all 7,000 a few hundred files that we had but they weren't all identical some had spaces after the line some didn't uh, some had exceptions in them it was messy at best so that's all been totally redone now and it's all universal now, in front of me here i have my main exodus folder i've opened up two windows to it because we're going to be in two different places at once here going into the exo folder we can then go to the Exodos folder, and this is a list of all the games in the pack. From here, I'm going to go into the exclamation DOS folder. This is where every game's launch files reside. If we look at $10,000 Pyramid, you can see that each game still has a launch file, a configuration file, and an install file. And then there's an extras folder. We'll get to that one in a moment. If we look inside the launch file. It's very, very small. These are identical for every game in the pack. So if I drop out and I go to high stakes and I open that one, it's the exact same file. There is no difference between these. All it's doing is ch checking to see what folder it's being executed from. It's assigning that to a variable. It's then going through and grabbing other names out of this folder, such as the full name of the game, which happens to be, if we go over to the games folder, the exact, high stakes, there it is, the launch file and the game file have identical names, and that's on purpose, because when it grabs this name from the folder, it now knows which file to unzip if you need to install it. And at the end, it calls util backslash launch. Now, if we look at the install file, it's the exact same thing. Very, very small, very, very basic. And it's going to be the same for every single game. The only difference is what folder it's being run from. You can see, there we go. Two of them identical. In this case, all it is doing is, again, grabbing the folder and then calling the install file. Now, if we drop back over to the util folder and we look at this, the launch file is now where all of the logic is encoded. This is not a small file. It is fairly in depth. And as you can see here, we have code in here to handle future language packs that are coming. Once it determines language, we get down here where it starts figuring out how to launch the game. Now, a key to this part of the launch is the dosbox.txt file. That is right here. This is a text file of every single game in the pack. After the colon is the version of DOSBox it will run. If there's nothing specified before it, this is 0.74 vanilla DOSBox. In this case, though, this is going to run ECE 4230. As you scroll through here, you're going to find lots of different versions of DOS. Because if we go back to the EXO folder, we go to emulators, we go to DOSBox, you can see we use DOM 6373. Uh, we've got ECE and SVN build. We've got three different later builds. We have a gunstick build, an MPU build. We are using staging for some things now. DOSBox X, a later version of X, and then TC, which loads transcopy uh, images. Why? Because there is no one single version of DOSBox that can run every game in Exodos. The Gunstick games, for example, were designed to be used with a small uh, light gun. The Gunstick copy of DOSBox maps your mouse to the little crosshair so you can play the shooting gallery games with your mouse now. Then ECE is what we're primarily using to load our MT32 and Sound Canvas 55 uh, fluid synth ROMs so that we can have advanced sound support. And staging is what we're using for all of our shaders and hopefully in the future for more. Um, 
And then I believe we're using X in cases where um, we have some games would take digital audio um, and they could shove it through the PC speaker's deck. And by doing that, you've got sounds through the PC speaker that sounded almost like speech. Regular vanilla DOSBox does not handle this very well. If you start a Silmarils game, there's this really loud high-pitched beep. And I always thought that's, that was what they did. That's improper emulation. If you listen to a Silmarils game starting up in X, you get a multi-tonal kind of intro. And that's what it was supposed to sound like. We also use X for printer support uh, at this time. Now, the cool thing about this DOSBox file is if I want to change the way 3D Bomber gets lost, all I have to do is change. I can delete out that. It'll be vanilla DOSBox going forward. I can change it uh, to an X, and now we'll launch using X. It'll even, what I love about Note, Notepad++, it looks at my other entries in here and tells it suggests what I might want. The point here is if you want to use a different build of DOSBox, and believe me, there's no guarantees that changing it will work, but if you want to try it, you can back up your DOSBox.txt file, you can do a find and replace, and change every instance of ECE4230 to staging, and it'll let you do that. And now, every game that was going to launch with ECE4230 will now launch with staging. Uh, it's a very easy way to change the version of DOSBox that you're launching with instead of having to go through and manually change 7,200, or in this case, 7,600 uh, bat files to change the version. Now, if we go back over to that launch after it does that, it's now determined the game. It will also looks at the multiplayer.txt file. If a game is in that text file, it means it does support... Ooh, I hit the wrong button there. To go. I am doing an update on the pack right now. I guess that file has not come through yet. It's a very similar index. If a game is in that file, then it will generate two text files in the game's folder. One is your local IP and one is your wide area network IP. And it provides them to you during the setup. That way, if you do host or join a game, you'll have the exact IP you need to give to who, if you're hosting, you give it to the people that are going to join you. And if you're joining, you're going to type in what the host gave you. So everything is now handled outside in the util folder rather than by the game's launch file. And finally, you get down here and it will check for an exception.bat file. Uh, let's go to Loom. I believe that one's got one. And there it is. If an exception file exists in the game folder, then at this point it will deviate and come back over here to see what's going on. Now we use exception files to, for example, give you the option to launch ScumVM or DOSBox, but we use it in other ways too. Some games, for example, had Tandy versions and IBM PC versions, and there's a difference, enough that we wanted to include both. Now, because DOSBox's machine type has to be defined before the game launches, using an exception file, we can ask the user which machine type they're going to be using, and then that way by the time you start launch, uh, I'm sorry, by the time you start DOSBox, it will be the proper version. We cannot start DOSBox and then ask the question and then go back and change the machine type while it's running, at least with the most builds that we have. It may be possible with some of the newer builds, staging might be able to handle that, I'm not sure though, and exception files here, we have to use them anyway for ScumVM, so they're a great use for those kind of things too. At that point, it's going to come down. It'll call the IP bat to generate the IPs if needed, if it's on the multi list. And then finally, it actually goes to launch the game. It calls the version of DOSBox that we defined earlier. It then goes and grabs the configuration file from the game's folder. And then finally, it goes and checks this options file that is over in the DOSBox folder. Now that file, options, is what we call the global configuration file. Inside here, we have whether or not you chose full screen or windowed when you install the pack. Uh, it'll ask you if you have a small, medium, or large monitor, and it gives the resolutions of what that means. And that defines your window size. That way we don't accidentally make your window too big for your monitor. 
But then also, we don't want you to have a 4K monitor and your window is super tiny. <clears throat> Excuse me. You've also got your aspect ratio defined here. So these global settings, when you set them, are going to be for every single game in the pack. Now you can change them by running the install file again. If we drop back up here to a smaller game where we can get through it quickly, like $10,000 Pyramid, I'll run install. It's done. My current global settings are, I'm in windowed mode. I have a medium desktop resolution set, 1080, and apparently a large too. I think my uh, synchronization has uh, messed up there. <laughs> this is, uh, let's see here, that should be hiding right over in the util folder. It reads these settings from in here. So if I, oh, there, so now you see the multiplayer text file is here suddenly. It wasn't here earlier. I'm not sure. There it is. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and close this. You can see we have window is our SEL file. That's how it knows we're a window. Now you see there's a large and a medium. Knowing that wouldn't happen, but because of the way I'm synchronizing files for my main computer, it was conflicting. So I'm going to delete the large out manually. I'll run install again. Now the game was already installed before. So now it's going to say, well, do you want to uninstall the game or configure it? I'll hit C for configure and I'm right back at the same menu as before. You can see I'm in windowed mode. It only shows medium desktop now and aspect is turned on. If I choose to change one of these, I'm going to stay in windowed mode. And then it asks me what my primary desktop resolution is. We've gone with 4K, 1080 and smaller than 1080. This laptop I'm on right now happens to be a 2K laptop. So I'm going to go with medium. And then yes, I'm going to keep aspect ratio on. So even though I didn't change any settings, it has rewritten that global options file. And if I go over to .comp file back over in the emulators folder, you'll see that the date has changed on it since I've just made those changes. And there it is right there. Today's August 31st and it is 7 to 6 p.m. right now. The file has been modified. I reload it. Oh, the resolution did change actually uh, by picking that. Now if we go back to the launch, it's loaded the global options and it calls the game. Another big difference now, I'm going to go ahead and uninstall the game and I'm not going to back it up. If I run the game directly, not the installer but the game, it detects that the game is not installed now. It asks me if I'd like to install it. I will click yes. I'm not going to change anything. I'm not going to change my graphics filter. And previously this would cause the game you didn't have to go launch the game a second time. Love that sound effect. Now, when you run the launch, if the game's not installed, it will call the installer and then drop back to the launch and continue launching the game. So you don't have to do it twice anymore like you used to. Let's go ahead and uninstall that out. And I'm not going to save anything. Now, I did talk about this in another video. I'll cover it briefly here. We did make it so you can back up your saves now. If I hit yes here, it will do a difference on the installed game folder versus the file before you installed it. Any files that have been modified since then will get backed up in a small zip file that has the exact same name as the game. If you notice over here in your main Exodus folder, there's also a save folder. It's empty right now. If I click yes, I would like to back it up. It will create a $100,000 pyramid file. And inside that file is anything that may have changed. In this case, nothing changed, so it's an empty file. Had I created a save game or modified the settings or anything that might've been modified at all in the game, it would now be in that file. The next time I install that game, so we're gonna install it. It says, hey, you've got backed up saved data. Do you wanna restore it? If I hit yes, it will, First, install the game, and then it will go grab the difference files and extract them over the top of the game. So you'll be right back to where you were before you had uninstalled it last time. In this case, I'm going to hit, if you hit no, it'll install the game. It will ignore your backup, but it will keep it on the hard disk. And then finally, I can hit delete, and that just gets rid of it because I decided I didn't want it anymore. So it has now installed the game, but the game did not get modified, and my backup is gone. If I go to uninstall, it will ask if I want to back it up. I will say no this time, and the game is uninstalled again. You can take those files and email them, trade them back and forth to different computers, and then that way if you get to a point your friend is stuck at, or you want to share your progress in a game, 
You can zip that file over to somebody, they can put it in their save folder, and when they install, it will ask if they want to restore your backed up save data. It's really great if you have Exodus on multiple machines or you just like to play socially with other people. Now we're going to go look at the install file. This is also universal now. There is one install file for the entire pack. Again, um, a lot of language built in here. And until those language packs come out, that logic will sit dormant. But once they do come out, there is some really neat features here. If you happen to install the German language pack, the French language pack, and the Polish language pack, when you launch a game, it will go see if there are versions of that game in that language. And then if there are, it will provide you a launch menu and it says, hey, I see you have this game in multiple languages. Do you want to play in English or German? Uh, or maybe it says, do you want to play in German or French? Because there's not an English version. That gives you control by only having one entry for the game in launch box instead of multiple for each language. And from that defined entry, you have the option to launch any language you want that has been set up by the language packs. As we continue down here, um, it will. this is the coding for the light version. The light version of Exodus is massively different this time around. There will be an entire video all about it once I've completed putting it together. Exodus Lite is just the front end, none of the games. This makes it, well, Exodus Lite in version 5 was 55 gigabytes, which is not very small, but it was one-tenth the size of the full pack. The light version of version 6 is less than 5 gigabytes. That may not seem small, but when you're talking about a front end that has image data and metadata for over 7,000 games, it's very small. When you run a game, it will check to see if you have the game on your hard drive. If you don't, it will ask if you want to download it. That's this logic right here. It appears you have not downloaded it yet. It will tell you the size of the game. If you click yes, it'll do a command line launch of ARIA, which is a torrent client. It will go grab the game from the full Exodus torrent and pull it down for you. It will then install it for you. After it has downloaded, it'll clear out all the cache and everything and prepare for the next one. Now you cannot download more than one game at a time. And because it's a torrent, it may take a little bit of time to find some seeds. So please be patient. We commonly get people come to our help channel and say, hey, light version's not working. And then they come back five minutes later and say, oh, it just started working. It's not instantaneous. That's part of the drawback of using a torrent. But it also means there are always going to be cedars out there. You don't have to worry about something getting taken down and it's pointing at a dead link now. After the game has been downloaded, you have the unzipping part. Here's where it will back up your data for you. And then finally, down here, the configuration settings. If you change something, it will delete the SAL file. The SAL file is how it knows what your current settings are. That way it can display them to you without having to go try to read them and decode them from the configuration file. Also, the first time you launch them, it will explain all this to you, the global settings. Uh, once you've seen that and you have moved forward, it'll create a little flag file and it will not prompt you with all that information every single time anymore going forward. Now, let's talk about the extras folder. Most games, well, all games will have at least this file, the altern alternate launcher.bat. Some games have a lot more in there. Uh, if we go to Monkey Island, for example, that's which one I know has a ton. There's all your extras are in here. There's uh, game recreations. This is the uh, interactive code wheel I talked about in a previous video, the design sketchbooks. When you go into LaunchBox and you right click on a game, it is in real time, thanks to Timber's plugin, analyzing this folder and then creating a real time list of all the documentation for that game. Uh, that means that when we add new documentation, all we have to do is place it in that folder and you can see it in the front end. We don't have to create individual additional application entries in the LaunchBox XML anymore. Uh, it makes things a lot faster for us and a lot easier to maintain, as well as not burying this data under two or three levels under the, the right click of the game, where I think most people wouldn't find it. Now, the alternate launcher allows you to launch with all kinds of cool little features. 
I'm going to do a whole video just on the Ultimate Launcher, so please watch out for that. I'm not going to get into it right now because we're still adding stuff to it, even though we are getting very close to trying to wrap this up and release it. Um, the guys over at Staging, specifically uh, John Novak, have done an amazing job with their COT shaders. And I really wanted to get that work into Exodus before we released version 6. And it's looking like we're very close to having that in the next official release. So uh, another reason we don't have an official date yet is we're trying to get some real cool features in there at the last second. Now, one thing that we've covered here that I want to really hammer home is everything has been decentralized. No, everything has been centralized. <laughs> Opposite. Strike. Reverse. <laughs> um, no longer do you have 7,000 individual launch files out there that you have to go mess with. It used to be someone would say, how do I change the version of DOSBox that you're using? It's like, well, uh, you edit 7,000 files. Now you can go to the index file and do a quick find and replace on that. Um, if we want to change the logic and how a game launches, we edit the launch.bat file. Every game now changes the way it launches. Uh, it really cleans things up, makes it much easier to maintain. Uh, we don't have to worry about running a mass change on the games, and it works on 6,800 of them, but not the other 600. And then they get left behind. Uh, we don't have to worry about a one or two files had a weird you know, character in them, so they don't take the change, but now they don't work anymore. It's literally one file for every single game. Um, I'm very proud of that, and it's something I didn't know or didn't think we'd ever be able to do. And so once it, 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 we got it done and it worked, um, I have to say, I think I got it working like two months after version 5 came out. <laughs> I remember sitting there thinking, this is a game changer. It's huge for Exodus, but I can't justify putting out a new release two months later that doesn't add new games or other features. It just totally redoes the back end. So I've spent the last three years adding a ton of other cool stuff, but this is the fundamental change that really changes how the fundamental change that changes everything. The fundamental change that modifies the way Exodus version 6 works and makes it so much slicker, so much quicker. Uh, in the old setup file, when you said I want to do aspect ratio on, it used the text replacement tool and it went through and it edited all 7,000 of your configuration files to change them all to say aspect on. Using the global configuration con configuration file, it makes one change now. Uh, we ran into recursive uh, loops with people who had certain uh, fat drives. Um, it got stuck and it could take hours. And people would say, hey, I think my, stuck, my setup's broken. And we'd have to ask them, well, can you move it to an NTFS drive? Because then we don't have that same problem with the loop over there. No more. Those are no longer issues. Um, it's, it's a game changer. And I'm very proud of it. I'm real happy with the way it works. And I wanted to put out a video that specifically talked about how the back end works. And this is really for the people out there that want to change how DOSBox is, uh, which version is loading. They want to understand, like, okay, well, what's the relation between this folder and that folder? And, you know, so as, as we talked about, you have your games folder, and the DOS folder is your launch folder. Now, if you need to know, like, well, how do I launch 3D Hero? Which folder is it in? I mean, you can always come over here and type in 3DH and see, oh, there's 3D Hero. But if you're not sure, open up any DOS game, and here it's 20,000. Whatever folder is inside the zip file, Ackman, is the folder to launch that game. So, like, Adventures of Willy Beamish, for example, is in the Beamish folder. But it took me a while to remember that. I used to go to ADV Beamish or ADV Willy and... So if I can't remember, I can go to the game, I can pop it open, I can see the folder's Beamish, I can come over here, I can drop down to Beamish, I can go into it, there's my launch file and my installer for it, there's all my extras for it, everyone's got to have the Pizzarama menu, and the secret notebook. Oh, this is another, we had the 1991 video catalog from Sierra Online, which featured Willy Beamish, and of course the trailer they released for it in 91. Hopefully, this video helps understand the relation between these things. Uh, Exodus is not closed source in any way. This is a conglomeration of batch files. And I do love the fact that Exodus runs on batch files, something endemic to DOS. 
Uh, and for the most part, other than a few PowerShell scripts that we use to grab IP addresses and such, this is something that a lot of these batch files would run in DOS natively. Um, so I love the fact that here we are in 2023 running a DOS collection on batch files and it works, it does amazing things, it has global configuration settings, um, singular launch and install files. Um, it's really beautiful the way it all works to me. Now, I'm a proud father though. I've been working on this for 15 years. So I've seen how far it's come. I understand that I'm probably very biased in my appreciation for the pack, <laughs> but I hope others enjoy it as much as I do. And I say that in every video because that's the whole point. Why would anyone work on this for 15 years if they didn't want other people to enjoy it? Why would anyone put that much time and effort? I've been asked before, how many hours have I put into this? Back in 2018, I guesstimated 10,000 hours. I probably put another 10,000 since then. And that's just my time. That doesn't include all the amazing people on my team and that have volunteered that are not even part of the team that have just come and done stuff and then left. We're talking about an effort that is Herculean. And I could not be prouder of where it is currently. I'm so excited to share version 6 with everybody out there. If there are things about version 6 that you would like a clearer understanding on, either before or after it comes out, please come to the Discord and pitch those ideas. I'll make a video about it in a heartbeat. Um, right now, I'm making videos based on the things that I know people either don't know yet or the questions I hear all the time. But the real key will be talking to the people who have seen the videos and have used the pack and answering those questions, the things that haven't crossed my mind yet. Thank you for watching. See you next time.